It's July the 9th, 2010, and we're gonna go in after a moss animal. <laughs> I don't know, you got, you, can, can you see this thing? It looks like a balloon right there. This is, this is it? <laughs> yep, that's it. I'm trying to make sure we have good, uh... <clears throat> and it has kind of a dent, maybe on this side, and it feels Whoa, really, really spongy. Like just a big mess of really light algae. Yeah, like I push it and it pops back out. And it's covered in like white, white stuff. Little bits and pieces. Is there any more moss animals in here that people can see? Where did this name come from? So if I move the stick, yeah, the whole thing kind of drags. Oh yeah, you can see it just kind of bubble along. There was more stuff over here, but I wasn't sure. That, like, this just looks like plants in here, huh? Oh, yeah, there's another one over here, but it's further away. Can you pull that one up by the stick that it's attached to? Oh, so, Colin Novick, what are these? Colin Novick, Greater Worcester Land Trust, what are these things? Uh, well, those particular ones are Pectinatella magnifica, the Latin name for the particular freshwater rhizome you're looking at. Okay. And I looked it up. And this is a colony animal. Or this is it is a colony animal. In many ways, it behaves, uh, it's analogous to a uh, coral. Lots okay. and lots of single-celled organisms, all next to each other, all operating as a big gang. Are they single-celled? Wikipedia, I thought it said that there may be half a millimeter. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, not single, they're not, they're, they're, there are single individual units. There are zooids or something like okay. that. Okay. Okay. But yes, one millimeter thick, and then uh, they just make a thin coating. The reason it was so spongy is that the entire inside is like a gelatinous water thing. And that's how they, what they use to filter food and whatnot. Is that uh, that, that actually they just sort of uh, when they're filtering, they pull in water and food, and then they sort of pump it back out, and uh, it basically they end up using that that stuff to sort of create a substrate around to live. Will they kill humans? They will not kill humans. They are not dangerous. Not only that, but in fact, in many ways... Wait, there's still a little on my hand here. Ah! <laughs> no, they're 500 million years old. So uh, they've been here longer than anyone. They, they saw the dinosaurs come and go as a Johnny come lately. They're not worried about us. They're just here having a good time. Where's the other one? Where's the other one at? The other one's harder to get to. What? Right straight out there, a right. the smaller one. I'm going to try it without dropping this camera in the water. Viewer at home, do you feel like you're going to be dropped into the water? Oh, there's a, yeah, it's another balloon-shaped one out here. And they always form around a stick. Oh, there's a couple. There you go. So there's a balloon-shaped one. And then here's like a little one next to it, which is like a sort of a glob on a branch. Oh, and there's another one over there. <laughs> Oh, they're all through here. They're all along this tree. Yeah, there's one globbed around over there. I'm really amazed by these. Like, how could I, you know, I don't know. They don't always show up every year, and they don't show up in big numbers every year. In fact, <coughs> there are a bunch of guys in New Hampshire who claim that they only show up in their ponds in big numbers when we've had a dry summer. When the water's really clear, really still, nice and warm, they just <coughs> go to town. This year, it seems like we have more of them in this pond, but I, I'm guessing along the edge, the coast of the, the pond, it has more to do with them not draining it last year than anything. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, they didn't drain this pond as they usually do and gave more room to grow. I'm kind of amazed that there's like, because I, you know, I subscribed to Ranger Rick and whatever as a kid, right? <laughs> like, I watched lots of PBS. Like, I feel like I know, I felt like I knew like most of the animals and even the obscure animals that were out there. There's like, but here's this invertebrate which creates these colonies which are like, this is almost kind of like a slime mold in a way. It's like an invertebrate, giant colony, <laughs> pretty awesome. Nobody cares. In fact, the people who Wait. the people who study these complain about the fact that nobody cares. Uh, for instance, there's like this whole game of uh, how everything is interrelated in terms of evolution. Uh -huh. People just shrug when it comes to these. They're like, ah, I don't know. It's confusing. It's sort of its own thing. Um, yeah, these are sort of like the neglected invertebrate. They're just sort of out there. So they call them moss animals. Well, the... they used to call them moss animals. See, a okay. long time ago in the land far, far away, we were trying to figure out how things were related. We did it based on what their characteristics were. In many ways, they sort of look and behave a little bit like moss, but they actually have nothing to do with moss. Okay. Um, so now they're ectoprocto, which has to do with their primary characteristic, which 
It turns out it has to do with where its butt is. Um, <laughs> it has the anus on the outside, ecto, outside, procto, anus. There you go. Oh. That's the whole family. And there are 22 species that live in North American freshwater. And, and this is... Pectinatella magnifica is one of them. And it's the most magnificent. It's also known as the blob. <laughs> <laughs> Common awesome. name, the blob. This is awesome. <laughs> the first place I ever saw these was there's a lot of municipalities now that run video cameras through their sewer lines uh, and will make that video public sometimes because they come across interesting things. And they do you know little robots to, to see if... You know, what what might be clogging up sewer lines and apparently these things love to propagate inside sewer lines so it's not uncommon to see big pulsating you know masses that are near blockages was, for entire sewer lines was this on like boing boing or something a couple yes, of years ago yes a couple ago? years ago and it was like this mystery in south carolina it was like a mystery animal that was just like living in the sewers and it looked like it was like almost breathing it was this massive thing it was actually a form of of well, your moss animals here wow yeah you know i just want to comment by the way a lot of nature shows they don't have enough coffee and cigarettes on the show. I'm glad that we're <laughs> keeping it. When was the last time David Attenborough showed up? <laughs> this is Marty Stauff of a Wild America. <laughs> <laughs> so also on the show. So let's 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 swing around here and sit down here. T- today we also have two. Colin, of course, has been on the show before. No. Uh, you've been on the show via the telephone, I think. Uh, have I? You have. The only other thing is we have a prop. <laughs> oh wait a second. Keep going. <laughs> what is this? There has to be a prop, but because there's sort of like a. They're all made up of one units. Oh. Basically, these are the tentacles. They all are hollow tubes, and it all pulls the stuff in, and it spurts it out the side. And there you go. You have colonies of millions of these all living next to each other. So wait, so it looks an awful lot like a cup with a glove. And when it gets, when you make it stressed, it sucks itself in, and then it's protected. That is. So you need a prop. You can't have an animal show without a prop. <laughs> How do you describe these things? All right, lots and lots of these right next to each other. Are they? So wait, are, is this is this the inside of the balloon, or this is the inside of the balloon? Uh, what do you call it? No, the the what ends up happening is these suck in the food. Okay. Empty tubes, little hairs, cilia that sort of yes. push stuff in, goes down inside, a uh, little stomach on the inside, and then it sort of pumps it out, right out the side, spurt, spurt, and there you go. Okay. Now here, because of the freeze, you know, they, they die during the winter, I assume. In other areas, do they stay stay alive throughout the, the, the winter, or are um, they seasonal? No, usually, uh, <laughs> these guys are built to be resilient. They're okay. expecting their environment to get all screwed up on them. Um, so they end up going into a... Uh, they end up going into a state where they create basically one unit uh, that you can freeze-dry, uh, you, can, you can throw against the wall, you can do anything, and it ignores everything up until all of a sudden, bang, nice warm water, calm conditions and then it starts to reproduce and it becomes a colony again. Hmm. So they sort of like, when they realize they're stressed, they make one, one unit to sort of go in on the shelf and they just wait for conditions to get better again. Hmm. So this is like the ideal when we talk about resilient communities. That <laughs> these folks are the ones that have it all figured out. Something like this, there you go. <laughs> All right, well, so, <laughs> any more props? <laughs> I'm all out of props. All right, yeah. well, let's, well, so let's talk to our other, our other guest today. We have Stephanie Katz. How's it going, Stephanie? Pretty good. Dressed nicely for this weather. <laughs> and Jen Burt returning to the show. Hi, Jen. Hey. <laughs> and uh, I just wanted to, uh, <clears throat> we've been talking some about um, uh, jobs and the bad economy and how people are sort of uh, dealing with the bad economy. Uh, before we get into that, I actually wanted to uh, just comment on the front page of Worcester Magazine, which is now edited by Doreen Manning. Yes. You confirm this? Uh, yeah. Next week will be her official first week of, as editor. They've had a lot. Of, they've had a lot of editors down the last few months. What happened to that new guy? Danny Cross. Yeah. He left. We're not allowed to talk. Totally, cr- totally crossed out. Yeah, he left in a little less than a month. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. But we have great hope for Dory. Hope for Dory. It's all you. <laughs> just don't quit. You know, at the, yeah, at this point, it's like just consistency. Just like don't, just don't quit. She's been there for a while. Yeah. She, I mean, she was the, you know, the entertainment editor. Yeah. You, know? you just hang around and you're the editor. It's a good thing. <laughs> Keep it up. We're looking forward to good things. I, I, I just want to point out, I enjoyed this article. Actually, I only read the cover. This is about the. <laughs> this is about the five guys right, running for running for the uh, Republican nomination to run against Jim McGovern for U.S. Rep. I just thought it was awesome that the way that they did the the visual treatment of them. It looks like the same the same guy, five <laughs> times. What's interesting with this cover is remember the old Mag- Mad Magazine uh, foldouts where you fold the pages together and you have like a secret <laughs> yeah. picture. Yeah. If you fold this page together, you actually get Peter Blute's head. <laughs> you don't realize it really, but it all comes together. Let me see if I can. It's eight folds that you have to do. No, no, no. <laughs> that was blue. There it is. <laughs>
Anyway, Jen, Jen actually read this article, and Jen, you were saying that, that actually, yeah, I don't know if you want to comment on this. Jen, Jen, Jen was talking that based on reading the article, it also seemed like the same guy five yeah, times. I think you probably got everything you needed from the cover. They're all like, do something with like law or finance, and are like white middle-aged men. Puffy. That, like, are... Not bald. Not, they're like, <coughs> not Jim McGovern, that seems to be their campaign. And this is the thing, is that visually... None of them are bald. None of them have glasses. <coughs> so that's really the big race here, apparently. Well, see, Jim McGovern makes the bald thing work for him. You know what I'm saying? I, you know, I'm not criticizing anybody. I'm not criticizing these guys for being chubby in these photos. I'm not criticizing McGovern for being bald or having glasses. I'm just saying. I'm just, I guess what I'm saying is, Worcester Magazine, let's take it to the next level and, and give me, like, a little chart. My, uh, a friend of mine wrote a, uh, his master's thesis on Elvis movies, and one of the things... Uh, he learned from it that he would always tell me about was how do you tell Blue Hawaii from Paradise Hawaiian style uh, which are both Elvis movies and apparently the distinctions involve things like in one of them Elvis pilots a helicopter and one of them Elvis uh, rides in a helicopter <laughs> <laughs> and one of them Elvis sings by a pool with a guitar and another one Elvis sings by a pool without a guitar make a chart and say how do I tell you know these two guys to, apart like if, if they kept it simple like, remember when the libertarian party started getting a lot of traction and they, they invented that little graph chart where like you could you could take like a, a 10 question quiz and plot yourself on like, yes. the political landscape even if they just instead of the faces because you know again it's just Peter Blue uh, if they replaced it with some sort of graph where you could place each one of these guys on where they fall on the the crazy meter for uh, you know the political landscape, that would be more helpful. It's actually kind of creepy that Peter Blute would also look exactly like these guys, in this at least in this visual treatment. I don't know. The factory hasn't retooled in many years. Well, anyway, could well, they I hope be a that... colony. <laughs> could they be a, a, a single unit just replicated over and over again? I don't. They kind of like bubbles around. I, I, Are they political bry zones? I am. Here, I am here to criticize not these men. I am here to criticize no, Worcester I mean, Magazine the same. for could making them samey. I'm telling you, if if you know, if the only way to make them not samey is to be ironic about it, then at least be ironic about it. But don't make them samey in a straight way and try to make a point that way. Can so, you name any of these men, though? Marty Lamb. Wait, can you pick pick out which one he might be? I think this is Marty Lamb right here. Yeah. Because because white hair and everybody else has black hair. So there you go. Anyway. That kind of looks like Nick Gillespie from uh, Reason Magazine in the bottom left-hand corner. I didn't realize this? he was in the race. Yeah. Nick Gillespie. There you go. And this again. The articles. You can see what their names were. Yeah, I'm not, we're not. We're trying to talk about. We're not going to. Colin Novick just suggested we read the article. Okay. So um, I wanted to talk to these these two folks here about job stuff. Something that we'll actually care about a month from now. Um, uh Oh, by the way, we also have, just to stay distracted, we have one dime bag. Is that right? Oh, yeah. yeah. We, all, we like to do a little survey of this area to see how much drug paraphernalia is out here week to week. There's one dime bag yeah, this I've morning. Yeah, I've been picking up more and more of these. And I, <clears throat> I remember last year uh, we were saying that, you know, they look just like dime bags. There actually does seem to be a lot of powder residue in some of them. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say that I do actually think that a lot of these are heroin or some sort of analog, which is kind of sad. You know, it's We need to bring a portable drug testing kit. Kids... <laughs> Stop messing around with the opiates. That's I, I know your parents told you all drugs were bad and then loaded you up with infe prescription amphetamines and opiates, but come on, just back away from the table. Don't do not do too much of that stuff. Well, here, Stephanie, can you hold this camera mm -hmm. on me? Okay, because last week's inspirational quote was from Seth Godin, talking about how the uh, sort of the collapse of the factory economy could be a uh, positive thing for people. This week's inspirational quote is from this movie Up in the Air, which people should watch. It's awesome. It's about George Clooney flying around the country and firing people. And um, unfortunately, like whoever made this movie is like totally vicious and doesn't let any clips go up on YouTube. So there's no clip of this on YouTube. But I'm going to so I'm going to do a pretend I'm George Clooney. And this is what he would say when he would come fire people. He would say, and after they would become traumatized at the idea that they were being fired, he would say, anybody who ever built an empire or changed the world sat where you are now. And it's because they sat there that they were able to do it. Mm. That's my inspirational quote for you two guys. Mm. Do you feel, so both of you guys, you know, in your 20s, dealing with this bad economy, do you feel, do you feel <laughs> more inspired <laughs> or more depressed at this point about lack of economic opportunities? I guess... I think it's, I think there's opportunities and I think I'm feeling like there's opportunities in different ways and I try to like see things like on the positive so where it may not be as likely that I'll have a lot of money then there's you know maybe some opportunities for me to like seek out a different kind of lifestyle 
in order to be able to be okay with not having a lot of money. Okay. So where tell me where tell me where you are at? Share whatever you want to share about your career stuff right now. Oh. Uh, Farming bride. You gra- you're right now. You're and you're a college gr- you're a college graduate. I I'm a college graduate. Okay. I have a degree in biology, although I know. Do you have a master's nothing. or? Uh, I have a uh, bachelor's of science. Bachelor's, okay. Uh huh. Which I got from Worcester State College. Good deal. And uh, um, basically, my career since graduating from college has consisted of. Uh, being an AmeriCorps member for a couple of years okay. and then leaving that and I've just bounced around to a couple different jobs since then and traveled a little bit. I worked, I'm working in a, at a nonprofit organization right now doing office management. Mm-hmm. Um, last summer I was working on a tall ship and then I traveled for a little bit. And you're looking to return to ship I'm stuff. looking to return to working on a boat okay. this fall. Okay. And Jen, where are you? How are uh, things going with you? I, I went to Clark uh, and studied international development and social change, which is like this made-up major at Clark that no one else has. Um, and uh, I kind of did a bunch of weird temp jobs for a while. I worked at FedEx loading trucks and then worked as a substitute teacher at the uh, Raven Freedom School. Uh, and now I'm finally got a job that I'm excited about, I guess. Um, I'm working as a contract employee for Lutheran Social Services on an agriculture project. So You're doing like farming kind of stuff? Yeah, I'm, I'm helping people, like refugees that have come into this country pretty much within the last couple of years that want to be farmers in the U.S. Mm-hmm. and have like very limited economic uh, opportunities to farm. So we have like a two-acre farm in Sutton. Okay. Um, and, yeah. Cool. So both of you guys right now are working for nonprofits yeah. in that in that sector of the economy. Mister's yeah. biggest industry. Yeah. yeah. And so I just wonder, what are your? I mean, I guess I guess I could bring up. Uh, I guess I could bring up our third test case from the week. Did you guys read this article about this guy in, from Grafton in the New York Times? No. This is an no. awesome article. <laughs> This guy, so here's this guy, this guy graduated a couple years ago with a bachelor's in political science um, from a college, I guess, around here, and uh, he doesn't have a job, and he lives in Grafton, and it says, over the last five months, only one job materialized. After several interviews, the Hanover Insurance Group in nearby Worcester offered to hire him as an associate claims adjuster at $40,000 a year. But even before the formal offer, Mr. Nicholson had decided not to take the job. <laughs> don't, don't judge. <laughs> Rather than waste early years in dead-end work, he realized, he would hold out for a corporate position that would draw on his college training and put him, as he sees it, on the bottom rungs of a career ladder. So this guy is like the exact opposite of our thesis, that somehow this generation coming up now has this attitude that there is no corporate ladder or if there is that it's a very rickety ladder this guy is all like i'm not going to make forty thousand dollars a year doing you know white collar work like forget it Hmm. you know this is not my this is not my plan i just thought that was i was a little surprised did they have like any sort of punctuation uh (laughs) mark at the end of this story or was like has he found this dream job yet? i don't think no i don't think so and i think his uh, it was a little confusing i think his family is profiles and courage sort of thing this guy's going (laughs) all in when Conventional wisdom says, "Don't go all in." <laughs> I was just—I was just surprised. Like, I don't. Uh, yeah, I had no idea that there even was this wisdom among the youth now. Like, I because I know people. I know two people his age in Worcester who both like graduated from college, and are working at Starbucks, mm-hmm. and are not happy about working at Starbucks because it's not the career they want to do. It's not really meaningful work. Yeah. The customers are a drag after a while, but they're still working a job. Like, I mean, they're like, mm-hmm. you know, they're not just like, oh, this job is not on my. I mean, I don't get the sense either that, like, this would be beneath this guy, more that it's just, like, not on his agenda to take a job like this. And so, I don't know. I mean, I guess you guys, I feel like if you guys, though, were offered this job of, like, uh, a claims adjuster, you wouldn't take that. No way. You would be on this guy's side. <laughs> you would be like, this is not a job with a bohemian lifestyle that I aspire to. Not at all. <laughs> See, this is where we need to have a guy from Hanover now step out from behind that tree and say, Surprise! <laughs> Here's the job. Now don't take it. Now that you actually the opportunity. 
I just so I don't I don't like to read too much into these articles. Somebody was pointing out uh, the person who sent this to me pointed out that like you know you can always find anybody to represent anything and you can always present anybody to make whatever point you want. So I don't want to judge this particular guy because I don't know this guy. Uh, but uh, I don't know. What do you guys? I mean, I'm, I'm just wondering if this jogs anything in your minds. Well, I think an insurance adjuster is probably like this example <laughs> of like you know something like finance kind of thing that I would never go into for various reasons but I think my parents are always like you know you know you're you're working part-time like it's only it's like a contract you're only working through October like you could do you know you could change the world and do all these things you want to do in like nonprofit kind of community organizing realm and you could get like a more stable thing with benefits um and so I think that's like more of the like what this guy has offered that he turned down yeah. and is like the opportunity to move out of his parents' house. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> maybe he just doesn't want to move to Worcester. It doesn't talk about this, yeah. but maybe just the fact of working in Worcester is somehow. Yeah. Not not if he's looking for a Boston or a New York job. Who knows? Yeah. But I don't think that's the important yeah. part. I think the important part is that we're in a awful economy, and here you know here's someone who is offered a job, you know, doing something to pay the bills and turn it down for whatever reason regardless mm-hmm. of the reason and because he has like a vision for something something else Although in a, per- a perverse sort of way it would have been interesting if we could have picked up the New York Times and read a story about a guy who was just telling the New York Times I'm doing anything to avoid moving to Worcester <laughs> that, that would have been like the classic shot across the city's bow you know, the New York Times metro page is covering a guy from Grafton who just doesn't want to move two miles in the other direction I don't know I think too. I'd be interested to see what this guy is like doing with all of his time, mm-hmm. because I feel like there was a long time where I didn't really have a stable job, but I was just like doing things that I was interested in, and it also helped me get the job I have now. Yeah. So yeah. is this guy like I don't want this job, and is like sitting at his parents' house watching like <clears throat> cartoons? All you were, day? you like, were doing like the classic thing where you were volunteering. Yeah. This is what people say. They yeah. say. If you don't have work, you should go out there and be volunteering because then at least you're, I mean, you're showing people mm-hmm. that you can actually operate in the real world and yeah. actually do awesome mm-hmm. things. Yeah. But actually, I want to ask you because you're sort of, I mean, you're sort of, this is like, again, one of these like Seth Godin pie in the sky things that like you can, you can turn any acorn. <laughs> I don't even know if there's a good folk saying for this. You can basically turn any opportunity into something. Yeah. Um, that, so you were like, cause you're like sort of been helping run the art of show food co-op mm-hmm. for a while now and other community things. Yeah. Has any of that actually turned into job? I, th- I think so. I mean, like, a lot of what I do for my job now is, like, the marketing aspect, because really I know nothing about farming, but, and that's what these people I'm working with do know, but they can't really, like, figure out how to, like, sell a tomato in the, like, like, at a farmer's market. So that was something I had an experience in working at the co-op, was, mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. understanding how that operated. I mean, we sell a lot of our stuff at the co-op. Um... And doing other things, like, I was the finance coordinator for the um, for Stone Soup for, like, a long time. And I, like, taught myself how to use QuickBooks and do accounting software. So that was, like, <laughs> definitely something I'm using in my job now. You know, if you'd had experience as an insurance adjuster, yeah. maybe Stone Soup would have had their insurance <laughs> money by now. <laughs> it's true. Oh. See, I shouldn't. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was, or this guy. I could have, like, called him up. I need to make friends with insurance adjusters. I feel That's like this like, <laughs> yeah. line here. Well, I tell you, I feel like this guy is, uh, <laughs> like, this guy should come work at Stone Soup. Like, guy, if you're watching this and you're like, because <laughs> somebody told you these jerks are insulting you on the internet, like, you should come and go volunteer at, a, or at the artichoke. Like, come in, turn it, I mean, the artichoke is good. The artichoke could, could go to the next level with your leadership. If you took the artichoke to the next level, hundreds of people, connected people in the city of Worcester, would, hear, would know your name and would be impressed and would get you on that rung of the career ladder that you're looking for. Mm-hmm. Stephanie Katz, have you had any of this experience of like weird weird things leading to good opportunities or do you think that this is has this just been more of a theory in your life than a reality? Uh, I think weird things always lead to good opportunities. I guess I think I think if yeah, I think I agree with you that like where there, you know, if if there's if you have like some uh, interest and you're aware of what's going on around you and you're willing to kind of like look at it and and piece to get piece things together I think then then you're you know 
something's going to come along. I, I mean, that's not 100% true because obviously there's a lot of folks who are unemployed right now and are doing all of those things and not coming up with anything. But I think, I think you can, I don't know, I think you can piece things together. I wanted to read part, I wanted to read um, part of a long email we got in response to last week's show bringing up health insurance. This writer says, and if you want to email pieandcoffee at gmail.com, I will read your stuff on the show, but I will, you can be anonymous. That's fine. One major problem from my point of view behind the bad economy is the cost of health care. Insurance companies seem to be holding on to on cost increases until after the fall state elections. Our insurance company, for example, is asking us to sign a statement that says we would agree to pay any increase in rates retroactively. I guess their plan is to raise the rates retroactively if a new Republican governor wins. This makes for a budgeting nightmare. It's especially tough for small businesses already on a tight budget. Politicians talk about focusing on jobs, and the reason why jobs are scarce is the cost of health care. If you check it out, you'll find Worcester has the highest health care rates in the nation. Solutions that rely on increased taxes or smaller employers to pay out more is going to cost more jobs and further risk an already bad economy. I cannot believe we can't find a local solution to this, but maybe state regulations would squash that too. Um, so there you go. So that, that's that's actually something that we probably don't have time to talk about today, but I'm interested to talk to people about is like, to what extent is living in this free health insurance, you know, holy land of Massachusetts, yeah. make it easier to be a bohemian in this day and age? I mean, for me, I have I have a few different health you know health issues that aren't serious, but I you know I need regular prescriptions, and for sure, having I'm on I'm on uh, the Commonwealth Care. Yeah. I'm on like a subsidized plan um, right now because I'm working part time, um, and uh, and if I was if it wasn't for that, I think that I would have to make some serious like changes and you know reevaluate what my plan is. I I certainly really really appreciate uh, being able to have uh, affordable health insurance. Yeah, I don't think it would really change things for me if it wasn't if it wasn't available. Hmm. And then the next level of that very same argument is do, does having some mandated coverage plan it does it remain it may, we can keep it re- affordable for the populace but can we keep it re- affordable for the commonwealth because it seems like the right. big battle now is between the patrick administration and the health insurance agencies that are looking to raise premiums well as you said during the election cycle the patrick administration is trying to at least keep them level and that's yeah. i guess the goes back to the philosophical argument between health care actual health care reform as opposed to health insurance reform right you know, it might make sense in the short term for the consumer but in the long term does it make sense if it's being subsidized at the state level when the state is feeling the economic pinch the same way the general populace is. As they say on CNN, we have to leave it there. Leave it there? <laughs> leave it, we're going to leave it there because we only have like two minutes left and we also got more more things from the internet. <laughs> somebody somebody said, did you already talk about the summer nationals? <laughs> I don't know what to say. With I think we nationals. talked about them last year. <laughs> we did. Well, yes, we did. We Brendan said we talked about them last year. Yes, you can go back and watch that episode. Uh, Worcester World Cup, somebody said. Is the Worcester World Cup coming out? Yeah. Do you know when? Yeah, August. Maybe August. 17th? August, sometime in August. All right, we, can, we don't have to talk about that today then. We'll get, we'll get somebody <laughs> on to talk about that. Art in the Park and other park activities like the Bridges of Elm Park. Yes, yeah, Sori is doing this, another big like uh, art installation in the park at the end of August. Cool. As I, part of Art in the Park? As part of, like, in conjunction, I think, with Art in the Park. Um, we'll get Nat Needle or somebody on to talk about that. And the Arts for Animals at the Worcester Animal Rescue League on Holden Street is having a thing on Saturday, July 17th from noon to 5, like a fundraiser, I guess. I just got that via the email, too. Well, guys, thanks for being on the show. You don't for, do job postings, right? Do you have a, do you <laughs> look, a job issue. Do you, you have want, a job issue? Are you looking to hire somebody? We have a job somebody? posting. Yeah, we're looking for a full-time AmeriCorps person to do land stewardship for the Greater Worcester Land Trust. Uh, it would have health care. What's there. your What's the email? Uh, the email would be uh, Mary M A R Y at G W L T dot org. There you go. There you go. Paul Novick, ladies and gentlemen, a font of jobs. Brendan Malikin. <laughs> I have no jobs. <laughs> Jen Burt. Nothing. I don't have any jobs. Refugee farm helper. Yes. <laughs> and uh, Stephanie Katz. If anyone wants to volunteer. Thanks for being on the show for the first time. <laughs>